Hey, this is George Mazzell again, Super Magnet Man. I want to take just a few minutes and let you know about what we're going to be presenting over the next few series of videos. We've gotten so many questions through the years about understanding how magnets and copper work together. Specifically copper. People want to know because they're interested in windmills, they're interested in alternators, generators, motors. All of these things have to do with how magnets interact with copper. Now this is going to be a non-math video course. We are not going to be showing you how to derive all the, the equations and work through all the Faraday equations and all of these kind of things. We're just going to show you how it works. We've got an oscilloscope that's going to be working with us, an iPad oscilloscope that's going to help us out. I've got my digital multimeter and then we just got magnets and copper. To start with, the first thing we want to do is understand how the magnetic field works around a magnet. When you take something like this two inch cube, this is an N52 cube we're going to be using for most of what we do to get started with and help us understand. But when we're working with something like that, I want us to take a look at how the magnetic field looks around this magnet. As I take the gauss meter, and you can see the end of it is where it is, it's coming across the magnet now. Notice that while I'm off of the magnet, we're reading north pole. Yet the top of the magnet is south pole that I'm going to be working with. But notice what happens as our wire is going to approach, it's going to be traveling over north, 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 and then immediately at the edge it switches to south. It increases in intensity as it goes across, then it goes back over to the edge and drops off and goes back to North Pole out here. You're going to see that as we move this copper coil across the magnet. What I start with is this little loop of wire. It's about 16 or 17 turns, number 26 gauge wire. And I'm going to sweep it across the magnet. And we've got our oscilloscope. You're going to be able to take a look and see what it looks like. And we're going to get a signal read off of our digital multimeter. And as I sweep across just one time, you can see what has happened with this wave. Now we're going to take just a minute to look at the wave and get a feel for what we're seeing. As you look at this wave, and we, we zoom in on this, you can see what I was talking about. As I was going and approaching the magnet, uh, the magnet, it's going down. That was indicating that we're North Pole, the way I've got it wired up, and it's pushing the signal down. Then as it bumps the side of the magnet, you see the little bump, and then it goes to its maximum value above the South Pole. As it continues across the magnet and gets closer to the edge, it immediately goes in the opposite direction and you can see that's when it goes straight down to the end. And as we're going across that North Pole that's continuing to decrease, it comes back up to flat line across here. Now what we're going to do is this time move it across just a little bit faster, go back and forth and get us a little bit different signal to look at. So if I take this and I go back and forth really fast, and pause it at this point. Now you can see the direction. I'm going in one direction, then the other. So you can see how the signal goes up, then down, and in the next one it's going down, then up. That's showing it's when it's coming back across the magnet going in the opposite direction. It's still traveling over north, then south, then north, regardless of which direction that it's coming from. But this will help you see how the coil of wire mixes with the magnet. Now what we're going to do is take a look as the magnet moves across the copper wire. In this particular example, I have taped down or mounted the coil flat and I'm going to be taking the magnet and moving the magnet across the coil. And you'll be able to look at this. I've got a piece of acrylic plastic across the top of it which gives me a way to look at this and slide across it but always know that I'm maintaining the same air gap. So as I slide the magnet across, you can see how the signal looks. You can see that as we approach this coil with the magnet, this is the North Pole is facing down, so we're facing it with the North Pole. But off to the edges is South Pole, and that shows the field going up on the edges. Then you see, just as the South Pole gets right over the top of it, how it goes, or the North Pole gets right over it, it goes really deep because it's now directly over the maximum strength of the magnet. Then as it starts to go over the second coil, 
coil, it goes in the opposite direction because we're on the other side of the coil. This side, the windings are going like this. This side, they're going like this. So it's going to be opposite. And then you see, as we go across the other side and it tapers away, you can see the curve taper back down. This is what's happening. Now we're going to take a minute and see what it looks like as we change the speed that the magnet is moving at. And it's just going to be as fast as I can move it. And I move it back and forth, and you can see how it went off scale on the oscilloscope. So what I'm going to do is take just a second and get us a scale that we can work with. 500 millivolts might be pretty good on this. Let's see if that works. All right, now we're able to keep it all on the screen, but you can see the distance between it is our frequency, how fast we are going. And you can see on the digital multimeter what our maximum values are showing up as about a half a volt in this case. So this gives us a little bit of an idea of the relationship with speed and the intensity of the magnet and the shape of the copper coil. Now what we're going to do is take a look at another coil design. Let's see how it looks if we have a smaller magnet area than we do coil. This time what we're going to do is take a look at how we need to match up the magnet with the size of our copper coil. And I'm going to show you what this looks like. I've got a large copper coil here that you can see is several times as big in diameter as the width of the magnet. So as I take the magnet and move it across, I want us to be able to see how this magnet is interacting with it. And the kind of why we want to as we're making it, we want our magnet surface area to very closely match up with with the size of our coils. But if you take this, and you see I'll move across the first one, and you can see in the oscilloscope how we generated the little wave. Then I go over the other side and how we generate the second half of the wave. Now we're gonna go across a little slower and just all in one move, and you'll see the two signals as we come up. As we approach it, as we're making power, coasting, making power. And then if we go a little faster, you can see the faster we go, the higher the, the peaks get on this. And that's what we're trying to do, is see just how much power we can get out of this. Taking this extra size means you've paid more for the copper, but you're not getting any work out of that copper because it is adding to resistance, but it is not giving any more magnetic power. Your force, your electric power is going to come from the number of lines of flux coming off of this magnet, making a right angle to the copper that it's passing over. Now what we're going to do is look at another variable that we deal with in designing the best alternators and the best motors. That is the size of copper wire. Now one of the fundamentals about the copper wire is resistance. The larger the diameter of the wire, the less the resistance. But the higher the cost, the higher the weight. So there has to be a trade-off to give us the best. But what we want to do is take a look now at how does this work. So if I look at this coil, you can see I've got number 12 gauge wire. The other coils have all been number 26 gauge. So what we're going to do now is look at 12 gauge wire and see what it looks like with our oscilloscope on here as we approach it and move across. You can see the signal we're generating. We go faster and faster on here and we're getting more and more power out of it as we run across it, but we don't have as many turns. This is the other trade-off. The size of wire versus what we're trying to do. If you look at how large the wire is, the larger the wire, the fewer the turns we can get because it takes up too much space. It'd be like if you're trying to wrap rope around something as opposed to string. The string is much smaller. However, the smaller the wire, the less current it can carry. So we can't put as much uh, energy through it. The other thing is, is the smaller the wire, the higher the resistance, which means it's going to have higher losses. So we look at a way to balance this out when we're trying to design motors or generators or windmill alternators and things like this. So now what we're going to do is take another look at this waveform. This, so I can freeze the oscilloscope and take a look at what we're getting. As you look at this, you can see that you have 
the signal, as it approaches, it creates the positive wave. The current is going through it as the way the coil is wound. It's going through it. It's pushing the signal up in this case. It goes through the dead space in the middle. That's where it goes all the way back down to negative. Now it's going over the other side of the coil and it pushes current in the opposite direction and sends it off and then you see it taper off on the end. So that's what we're seeing, but this is what's happened when we go to this other wire. It's a larger diameter wire and so it gives us fewer turns to amplify the signal. So that's what I wanted you to see with the larger wire versus the smaller wire. Usually smaller wire is going to give us the best performance in our moderate size motors and alternators. If you're trying to produce five kilowatt uh, windmill, you just are gonna have a hard time doing that with just using number 26 gauge wire because it cannot handle that much power. Now, yes, you can parallel wind five, six, seven strands of the number 26 and probably get a little bit better wind out of it and get a little bit more power out of it, but you're also gonna be increasing resistance. If you're going up in power and you're wanting to produce a lot more power, you need bigger wire, you're going to need larger magnets, and you're going to need large enough coils to cover that. Now we're going to take a look at one of the most important things in designing motors and alternators or pretty much anything where you have magnets moving against copper. And that's our air gap. Air gap is something that really makes a big difference and we want to see just how much of a difference it makes. You notice that I've been using this sheet of acrylic plastic to separate it. It's 2.4 millimeters thick. So what I'm going to do is start with this coil and I'm going to generate the maximum voltage that I can generate as I go back and forth. Okay, our maximum voltage we were able to get was 1.092 volts. So now what I'm going to do is add a little bit of air gap to it. I have two sheets of this plastic and I'm going to put the second one underneath this and increase our air gap to double that. It's going to be 4.8 millimeters. So now let's take a look and see what we get. Our maximum value was 0.952 volts. Now this doesn't sound like much, but it's, a, it's because of the size of magnet and the magnetic field that we're producing. Let's take a look with our gauss meter and see how that can help explain this drop off for us. Now what you'll see with the gauss meter is on the surface of the magnet itself, in the middle, we're measuring about 5,600. You can see as I move it around, 56, 5,700 gauss, 5,800, 5,900 as I get closer to the corners on this. Now let's put one piece of acrylic plastic in between it. As I measure now in the center, my gauss level is down to 5200. I moved to where it was 59. It's now in the 49, 47, 4800 range. Just 2.4 millimeters away, 4900 gauss, 45, and over to this corner, 41. So you can see just that little bit of air gap, how much it dropped off our magnetic flux. Now we're going to put the second piece in, giving us the 4.8. And you'll see that in the center now, instead of 5,200 gauss, I'm now down to 4,600 gauss. In the corners, we're at 3,800, 4,100, 3,500, 3,300, and back to the middle is about 4,700. So this helps you see how the air gap affects us with these strong magnets. As that distance increases, the lines of magnetism are going to drop off, which means the amount of energy you have available to cut through your lines of copper wire has dropped off. Now the same thing applies based on how thick the copper wire is. You can see this, so if I took a coil of wire above this magnet, and it's this thick, then the top half of this wire is getting very little magnetism compared to what I'm getting on this front edge. So what we try and do is optimize how thick do we need to make the wire so that we're still capturing as much of the magnetism versus the trade-off, which is our cost. Yes, we could keep making a coil, and this top part is getting a little bit of magnetism to it, but it cost us an awful lot to double the thickness of that coil. So as you design things, you want to make sure you're getting the optimum balance between the size of wire and the coil, the number of turns you can fit into that space, as well as your air gap. You want to try and keep that air gap as small as possible so you can use all of the energy on the top of your magnet. Now we're going to take a look at the last thing, at the difference between our neodymium magnets and ceramic magnets to see how much of a difference does our line of flux make for making this power. 
how does the type of magnet affect it? Well, the magnet's going to change the lines of flux. This is a ceramic, two inch cube, C8 ceramic magnet. On the surface of this magnet, it reads about 1500 gauss, just a little bit above 1500, 1520, 1530. This is the N52 Neo magnet, and across the surface of this, it's reading 52, 5300, 5700, 5800, 58, 59, somewhere in that range. So it's a little less than 6,000 gauss over the top of it. So it's about four times the flux density. Let's see how that relates to the power output that we get. Let's see with the 6,000 gauss across its surface what it gets over this coil of wire. As I go back and forth, you hear the beeps on my digital multimeter. That's telling me I've reached my peak values. You can see it on the oscilloscope, what we were doing. Now what we're going to do is see what value we actually got with the N52 for the peak. Our peak value was 1.032 volts using the ceramic, I mean using the neodymium N52 2 inch cube. Now we're going to do the same experiment, going back and forth as fast as I can, with the 2 inch cube ceramic magnet. So let's reset our gauss meter, I mean our voltmeter. Okay, and now we go. This is the 2 inch C8 ceramic magnet. Okay, let's see what we got as a maximum with that. 0 0.308 volts, okay? So you can see it's not quite four to one, but again, we're doing it by hand. We're not doing it with a machine. It's making sure it's always matching the same speed. But you can see you're getting about four times the power because you got four times the flux. It's not quite, but it's, it's close to that four to one we're looking for. That's what you want to notice from this is if you need more power output from the same mass of magnet material, the same volume of magnetic material, because they're roughly the same weight, then what you get is the neodymiums are going to give you higher power density for the same unit volume. So that concludes this first part of introductory lessons on how magnets and copper interact for some very very critical things that we have in the world around us because everywhere you look today there are thousands and thousands of devices that are using magnets and copper to make power to produce things to make things spin to make things vibrate everything around you today and tools and things like this use these magnets in a very special way so this helps you understand how they work together